Hi there, Will here. And today, I'd like to show you something that I think you might find quite interesting. This lovely machine over here. This is a Hasselblad Flextite X5, which the kind folks at Cape Film Supply have kindly allowed me to come look at and talk to you about. I am somewhat qualified to talk to you about it because I do uh, spend an excessive amount of time scanning on a version of one of these. So I'll give you a quick rundown of how they work and why they're superior to most other film scanners. But before we get into that, a brief overview of film scanners in general. When it comes to scanning film, there is a relatively large variety of ways that people do it. You've got flatbed scanners, which are sort of the lower end consumer scanners, dedicated lab film scanners, which is where uh, what your uh, lab most likely uses to digitize your negatives, DSLR scanning, which can be quite high end depending on how you go about it, and then uh, drum scanners, which is when a negative is fluid mounted to a glass tube that then is spun around super fast and uh, that's how the negative is digitized. The Hasselblad Flextite lives in a space sort of between a dedicated lab scanner and a drum scanner, a true drum scanner. It's actually called a virtual drum scanner because of the way that the negative is handled inside the machine. So what is it about Flextite scanners that make them so expensive then? Well, to give you a brief overview of the history of Flextite scanners, they started out as a company called Imicon that uh, was focused on making sort of top of the line, incredible image quality scanners that could render the best frame out of a negative or slide for print and other reasons, gallery reasons, for example. I'm not sure what the exact first model was, but the way I have it in my head is that it goes Imicon Precision 1, Precision 2, Precision 3. At some point in there, there was a different type of scanner which is very good but doesn't look like these, whereas the rest of them do look quite similar to this. They have the tower build. And then it goes Imicon Flextite Photo, which is a more small-sized consumer-level thing with the same setup in terms of a, a film bed and it goes up inside the scanner to scan, but uh, it can only scan medium format. Then after that, there's the Imicon 343, which I think around then is when Hasselblad acquired Imicon. So it's also known as the Hasselblad 343, which is the same sort of scanner, consumer level, like a Flextite photo, but it works on Firewire instead of SCSI, which all the previous scanners that I mentioned work on. SCSI, I think people still use it for server interfaces, but it's basically just a very big, old, weird-looking plug that works like Firewire. Firewire is like a USB thing that uh, was designed for Macs, I think. You can still adapt this scanner, for example, to run through a Firewire port into a Thunderbolt adapter, Firewire to Thunderbolt, and then plug it straight into a Mac. Anyway, after those scanners came the Imicon 646, Imicon 848, Imicon 949, or Hasselblad Flextite, the name is interchangeable, and then the Flextite X1 and the Flextite X5, this being the absolute latest, newest model. They only discontinued them in 2019, I think. The reason these scanners are so amazing is because the CCD sensor that actually takes in the image sits up here and then there's a lens below it that views the negative and the negative itself is transported in a specifically sized steel holder that's magnetized over a drum across the optical transport line, I think it's called. And uh, the CCD sensor only scans that one specific line and as the image is dragged across it, held perfectly straight, everything border to border will be scanned sharp. So there's no doubt that the negative itself is being scanned sharp. And if there is any loss of uh, sharpness, it's to do with uh, the photograph itself. The other way the Imicons maintain consistent sharpness is by having absolutely no glass between the actual path of the film and uh, the lens itself. So the lens scans the film directly with absolutely no glass in between it besides the actual lens itself, which is a rodent stock lens. The benefits of these scanners are the fact that you get sort of almost unsurpassed image quality and size unless you're using an actual drum scanner, which is a lot more finicky to use in this. There is no fluid mounting involved. You just chuck the negative into this holder, which can be a bit of a process, but uh, it goes in there, it comes out, and it takes a lot less time than an actual drum scanner would to get drum scanner-esque results. I'm not gonna say that they are identical to a drum scanner because there is probably some leeway there, but uh, an A0 frame, as I'll show you off of one of these, is just an incredible scan, through and through. The sensor, as well, as designed by Hasselblad, has, they had some crazy color technician working on that thing, and the colors that you can get out of these scanners are amazing. But, 
The downsides are, they are obviously incredibly expensive, ludicrously expensive, so expensive that uh, at a consumer level there is basically no reason to buy one unless you get one for a really good price second hand and are willing to brave the second downside which is the fact that they are somewhat unreliable. The best thing one can do for them is to send them in for a service but depending on where you are in the world that's either not going to be available or will cost a lot to get done. And if you were to want to send it in for a service at say Hasselblad in uh, I think there's a spot in New Jersey and in Sweden you need the actual box that the scanner comes in for them to accept it for a service because they don't trust it to be transported in anything besides the specifically made box that these originally came in. And the last and probably most prevalent downside is the fact that they don't have uh, technologies such as digital ice removing dust for you. So any dust that is on the negative when it goes into that scanner on the X5 it's slightly different because it does have a bit of light diffusion going on but any dust that goes into an Imacon for the most part you have to manually retouch and click off which sucks. Every picture that's ever been in any of the videos that I've put on YouTube I've scanned on my Imacon and uh, every piece of dust that was on them I've had to manually remove. To quote some specs for you this scanner can scan up to 8000 dpi on 35mm 3200 dpi on medium format and 2040 dpi for large format, 4x5, not 8x10, it can't, it can't scan that large. It can scan reflective documents up to A4 size, but it is not uh, able to scan anything negative beyond the 4x5 size. The reason the dpi scales is because, to explain it simply, the sensor only has so many data points it can interpret, and if it's a small negative, it can allot a lot of data points to that uh, size of negative, whereas the bigger the negative gets, the more data points need to be allotted in order to scan the larger size. So as you go up in size of negative, you get less effective DPI. Talking about DPI doesn't really give you a fair representation of how good this scanner is though, because the real greatness of it comes from factors that uh, are beyond DPI. If I could only scan frames at say A3 size on this thing and other scanners are capable of much larger than that which isn't the case I could scan up to A0 on this but anyway if I only could I would still scan on one of these because of the way it renders negative film and slide film as well. The reason the Flextite X5 is better than any of these other Flextites though and most other scanners is because it is capable of scanning immensely big files at incredible speeds. You can get a max resolution scan out of this thing which would print beyond A0 size natively, like there would be absolutely no loss if you printed at A0 with a max res scan from this thing, in one minute, which is ludicrously fast. The second uh, closest scanner to this one, the Flextite X1, would take at least 10 minutes still. So this one is just top of the line in every way. My scanner, which is also an Imacon, takes 20 minutes to scan an A0 frame. And uh, the precisions and all those sorts still, do the, still take 20 minutes as well. I'm not sure on timings for the 646, 848 and 949, but you can bet they're not going to scan a max resolution frame in uh, one minute. Out of interest though, I reckon we should compare what a max resolution scan off of this thing looks like compared to a max resolution scan off of, say, a Nikon Cool Scan. So this is the flex tight holder, which as the name implies, flexes and then holds the film tight so that it stays sharp border to border. You insert a negative like this, probably with gloves if you're a careful person, but I tend to handle uh, my stuff decently and don't as of yet have any fingerprints on anything. And now you're kind of ready to scan. Once you've got your negative loaded, which you can actually do on this nifty light table on the scanner itself, you uh, line it up in the software, tweak the colors as far as you can in flex color, which is not necessarily the best uh, color adjustment software in the world, and then uh, hit scan. Let's do a max resolution scan and uh, time it to see how long exactly it takes. So a minute 28-ish for a max resolution scan of the Emicon. Let's compare that to the cool scan. Starting out, we'll uh, check what the startup time on this thing is like because the flex light is pretty much instant in terms of startup for you to be able to scan and I've heard that the cool scan is somewhat not. We have to wait for that green light to stop blinking. Green light. 
One minute. One minute, ten seconds probably. Okay, now let's time how long it takes to do a max res scan on the cool scan. With ice, which is going to have an impact. I guess that's done. So that was five minutes and 20 seconds about. Well, we've uh, scanned something big on the X5 and scanned something big on the cool scan. And I can tell you for sure that uh, the user experience of the X5 is better. Not much better, because I mean, they both run on old software, but the old software for the X5, somehow you can get more done color-wise in it than the cool scan software. I know a lot of people don't even bother with that software and scan it as a positive, but for my purposes, I'm comparing the scanner software on both of these scanners just to give a direct idea of that. And besides that, I guess I'll uh, talk about the scans once I've had a chance to look at them properly. Let's have a look and see uh, how the two scans compare. This is the Hasselblad scan, and this is the cool scan one. The first thing I reckon one will notice is that the highlights are clipping quite a bit in the cool scan one, and these were both scanned for maximum tonality, so obviously the range of uh, exposure across this particular image is too much for the cool scan to handle. I mean, you could probably get more out of it in terms of uh, dynamic range if you scanned it as a positive, I reckon, maybe, but uh, that would be the first thing that stands out. Then. We're going to compare just raw sharpness at 100% uh, zoom, but because you can see the uh, technical higher DPI of the cool scan is making the image bigger, I'm going to just downsize it to be the same size as the Imicon scan. Although there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here comparatively already. But anyway, uh, image size DPI 3200. Okay. So now, that should be the same size as the Imicon, yes, and we can get a side-by-side -side comparison. So in the cool scan, the first thing that I'm noticing is that it looks sort of over-sharpened compared to the Imicon, and there's a lot more noise going on, digital color noise, as opposed to just the straight film noise that the Imicon has. And then in the shadows as well, there's slightly more detail, and they aren't as dirty in the Imicon as they are in the cool scan, you can see it's a bit sharper and there's much more tonality going for it. Whereas in the cool scan, it just sort of turns soft and muddy. And the overall cast on the cool scan is a lot more blue for some reason. Whereas on the uh, Imicon, it's got a redder look going for it. I guess we can compare as well the dust, because that is obviously the downside on the Imicon. So that's the sort of dust that the Imicon picked up. Whereas if we compare that spot, on the cool scan, no dust, the ice picked it up, which is a big time saver. And speaking of time, I was talking about the, the scan speed of the Imicon and how that's uh, its most impressive feature. And I suppose if you think about it in the sense that on an Imicon, you're going to have to retouch the dust off afterwards, it probably takes longer to get a workable scan out of an Imicon, irrespective of how fast it actually scans, if there is dust on it. In a lab setting, a proper lab where they're trying to run these to scan all of the film because they've got a bunch of high-end clients, they'd most likely have a very, very, very clean setup with absolutely no dust or potential for dust to end up on the negative and then scan it on a very clean scanner so that there just wouldn't be any dust to be retouched off of it. But in a consumer sense or someone that lives somewhere where there's dust because you more than likely live in a room that is going to have a bunch of dust in it, you're going to end up spending a lot of time dusting scans with an Imicon. So comparing these two, we'll just get them both to size zero and adjust the image size to be 3200. You can see, the Nikon has done something very weird with the colors. And again, there's this weird murky look across the whole thing. Whereas the Imicon is very crisp and the skin tones are looking somewhat natural. It does have a fairly hectic cyan cast going on for it still. But uh, it's not, you can still see that it looks more like life than the weird noise that the cool scan seems to be making up. And again, at 100% zoom, the, the, the Imicon is focused to the grain. And you can see that very clearly, whereas on the cool scan, everything is murky again. I should mention as well that uh, 
Effective DPI and what a scanner actually can get out of a negative is largely assumed to be sort of limited at 3200. When you go beyond 3200, the machine that you're using, if it can go beyond 3200 on medium format, is kind of just going to be making up data for the sake of uh, giving you a larger file, which you can see with this uh, cool scan because if you zoom into 100%, the, 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 there is no actual discernible sharpness difference. It's actu it actually looks a lot less sharp than the Imicon does at 3200 DPI. So it's just a paper specification, really, as opposed to an actual useful functional DPI. I've just done a quick color pass now on both of them to give a more accurate representation of the sharpness because I think the cast might have been impacting the perceived sharpness of the Imicon. So if we zoom into 100% here now, that compared to that is somewhat more comparable. They're just different scans in the end though, really. I mean, as a scanning technician and someone who earns a living doing this sort of thing, I'd much rather work with an Imicon scan because there is much more data in a much more pure form for you to sort of uh, adjust to the client specifications, where on a cool scan, the shadows have turned into sort of this murky mess. And I feel like if I bring them in more, yeah, it's still weird and murky compared to the Imicon scan. At the end of the day, it's just personal preference. And if you'd like to have a cool scan, you'll uh, spend a lot less than you would on a Haspel at X5. You can get different, older versions of the Imicons, but it, they're just going to be more trouble, really, than uh, most people would think they're worth. And to finish things off, I hope you enjoyed that. It was a somewhat long video, but hopefully relatively informative. And uh, if you're curious on doing your own investigation, I'd suggest reaching out to local labs that may have Imicons of their own that they'd rent to you to use. Because a lot of spots do have Imicons that they rent out, and uh, you can learn more m messing around with an Imicon yourself than I could ever impart to you knowledge-wise. Cape Film Supply, for example, where I filmed this video, you can go and rent their scanner if you'd like to, which I'd suggest doing, because they're lovely folks, and uh, they've got a top-of-the-line scanner, so go forth and learn about the Imicons, I guess.